Let's read God's word. John 5, 31 through 47. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another who bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. You have sent John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Yet I do not receive testimony from man, but I say these things that you may be saved. He was the burning and shining lamp, and you are willing for a time to rejoice in his light. But I have a greater witness than John's, for the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. And the Father himself who sent me has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form, but you do not have his word abiding in you because whom he sent, him you do not believe. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. But you were not willing to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive honor from men, but I know you that you do not have the love of God in you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive. How can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Amen. Stay there in your Bibles, please, in John chapter 5. Thank you for reading that text this morning. Stevens, we love you and we're so thankful that you're part of our church. As we begin this morning, I would just like to say hello to those who are watching with us from home online. Uh, we trust that you will give your whole heart and mind and body to the reading and the preaching of God's word today. A special greeting to Abby and uh, the people at the villages of St. Peter's. We know you're watching with us and we're so thankful and I hope that you're encouraged today. Also, I want to say uh, hi to my youngest son who's at home not feeling well today. Hi, buddy. I love you. Take care of mom, okay, while you're there at home. And don't play with toys while daddy's preaching. <laughs> we find ourselves in the last part of John chapter 5. Even though we have been separated by seven days and a ginormous party from the last time we met together and heard this preaching, we must remember for just a moment that this is the same conversation that we investigated last week. So let us... Take a moment, as the title of our sermon says today, Those Who Testify. This is Jesus' uh, justification for why he is claiming his identity as the Messiah, as the Son of God. And it comes about because of a miracle that happened. We looked at this miracle briefly last week. There was a lame man by a pool, helpless, unable to move, unable to do anything for himself, and Jesus comes and heals him. That was the miracle. But the conflict arose because Jesus did this on the Sabbath. And because he told this man to carry his mat on the Sabbath, to get up and walk and carry his mat, it put Jesus in conflict with the Jewish leaders who were right there. The temple was in close proximity to the pool in which this man was healed. So you can imagine he gets up and walks, walks past the temple. They see him. They accuse him. He says, it's not my fault. This man told me to do this. Jesus is in conflict with them because he's working on the Sabbath like his father, which was the greater claim. Because the father, the almighty God, is the only one who's allowed to work on the Sabbath. When Jesus says that he works like his father, he's also then claiming to be equal with God. Thus, the Jewish leaders hated him for two reasons. One, he violated the Sabbath, and two, he claimed to be equal with God. And then let us remember... What was Jesus' explanation or his identification of himself to them, the revelation of his identity? He claimed to be the life giver. He said, I can give life just like my father gives life. In creation, God made the world. 
He gave life to everybody. I give spiritual life. Just like God gives life, now I give life. I have the right to do that because God gave it to me. And then Jesus said, I also am the judge. And that also was given to me by my Father. He has given me the right to judge. At the end of time, the books will be open, and the one on the throne will be the Lamb of God, Jesus, the one who was sacrificed. So that brings us to where we are at today. This is the same conversation. So you must keep in mind, this is not just a brand new, open, you know, Sunday morning, 7 o'clock, cup of coffee, bagel, sit down with a friend, and you start having a, a loose conversation. No, there's, there's tension. There's conflict. Uh, he's judging them. He's telling them that how they think is wrong, and, and what they're counting on is misplaced. And, and there's people around, and there's been a kind of a hubbub, and this man's walking around, and he's healed. And so there's all of this going on, and Jesus continues this by justifying who he is. And he uses the testimony of others. So this is point number one. Those who testify of Jesus. This is the title of the sermon. It is the first point and the longest point. We'll get to application in point two and point three. Those who testify of Jesus. Verse 31, Jesus starts by saying, If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Now, that's a confusing statement for us in 21st century because we think that everything Jesus says is true. So why, if Jesus said it about himself, would it be a lie? Well, there's shades of Deuteronomy 19.15 in this conversation. Jesus, when he's talking with his Jewish leaders, is intimating the, the principle of the law from Deuteronomy 19.15, which you know that in the mouths of two or three witnesses, the truth is established. So, so Jesus is just saying, the validity of my testimony is not merely based on what I say, but on the accounts of other witnesses who also agree. You know the danger of basing a decision or a truth account on one testimony. Moms, have you ever had a kid run into your kitchen and accuse their little brother or older sister of doing something mean and harmful. And just when you're about to execute the righteous judgment from on high, in comes younger brother or older sister with a completely different story. You're like, oh, if I would have acted on that, that would have been a big mistake. The mouth of one witness is not enough. Multiple witnesses were needed in the Old Testament. You understand this. In 2009, in the state of Washington, uh, police trooper Trevor Downey noticed a car driving 30 miles an hour in a 50. Well, that's suspicious right there. Usually it's the other way around, right? Car was weaving in and out a little bit, moving kind of in a herky-jerky motion. So Trevor Downey, this officer, follows this car. And as the car notices that the police officer is behind him, the, the, the man driving the car turns into a house's driveway, the driveway of a house. So the police officer, like all good police officers, pulls him behind him, turns on his bright lights, puts the spotlight on him, asks the man to get out of his car. The man gets out of the car and says, officer, it's fine, it's fine. I know I was a little unstable back there, but I'm home now, and don't worry, I'm going to go in my house, and everything's going to be just fine. Well, unfortunately for the, the man who was driving intoxicated, uh, Trevor Downey didn't believe that he was home now because he had pulled in by chance to Trevor Downey's house. The danger of taking one man's word for it. If only this man could have had multiple witnesses. But Trevor Downey knew the truth. This is not your house. That man was arrested and investigated for drunken driving. And come to find out that it had been a habit of his. He had previous convictions for that. So there is a sense in which this is what Jesus is doing. Not just my word. He said, don't just take my word for it. But I have all these other witnesses, other people who will testify for me. But... But it is more than that. It's not merely appealing to external, reliable sources, but it is more than that. Let me, let me read this quote from D.A. Carson. He has already said, Jesus has already said in the strongest terms that everything he says and everything he does, we already heard that previously, last week, but in this conversation just a few minutes earlier. Jesus said, everything I do is from the Father. I only do the things 
the Father tells me to do. I, I say the things the Father tells me to say. The, the Father has revealed these great works to you that, that I've done, I, but he's going to show even more works in the future. So Jesus has already said in the strongest terms that everything he says and does is nothing other than a reflection of his perfect obedience to his Father. He says and does only what the Father wants him to say and do. His witness is therefore not simply his own witness, but it is the witness of the Father. So I know this might be a challenging thing to think through, but Jesus says, even what I'm doing, even what I'm saying, is not really my witness. It's the Father's witness because I'm doing and saying what the Father told me to do. That's what Jesus is appealing to here. So when he says in verse 32, there is another witness or another man who testifies or has testimony of me. There's a greater one, some of your trans translations might say. He's not speaking there of John the Baptist. He's speaking of God. Because the acts and words of Jesus appeal directly to God because Jesus is doing exactly what the Father has told him to do. So here in this passage, in this confrontation with the Jews, Jesus appeals to two witnesses. Now you're going to say, Curtis, well, why are there going to be four points under this one? Well, he appeals first to John the Baptist, which is a, a lesser witness, but the first witness given, the first testifier, the first testimony. He is secondary in value and in persuasion to the Father. But the Father's testimony is going to be split up amongst three phases or three forms. So we have John the Baptist as the first testimony, and God the Father, and God the Father will testify in three ways. So that's our four points under those who testify of Jesus. Let's look at John the Baptist, verse 32 through 35. Um, or verse 33, I'm sorry. You have sent to John, everyone looking at your scriptures, verse 33, you have sent to John, John the Baptist, and he has borne witness to the truth. Yet I do not receive testimony from man, but I say these things that you may be saved. He was the burning and shining lamp, and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. John the Baptist was the one who came before the Messiah to bear witness that the Messiah was from God. John 1, 7 through 8 says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all men through him might believe. He, John the Baptist, was not the light, but came to bear witness of the light. And again, in John chapter 1, verse 32, John bore witness, the Bible says. And this is what John said. This is his testimony. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him, Jesus. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. John the Baptist was this lesser lamp that shone and pointed to the light, Jesus Christ. John's testimony was solid. It came from God. It was prophesied in the Old Testament, and it remained. But sadly, those who viewed him, many of those who viewed him in the wilderness, they viewed him a promise, uh, with, a, with promise initially, with, with favor initially, but over time, they rejected his testimony. But notice the kindness of our Lord. He does not have to offer up John as a testimony. As a matter of fact, he says, I don't even need his testimony. I don't even need the glory that comes from John. We'll learn more about that later because he has greater glory. He has a superseding glory. But he says, I do this in order that you might be saved. Look at verse 34. Do you see the kindness of our Lord? And that he would appeal to a man they had all seen, that they had all heard, that some of them had debated, some of them had questioned. And he said, look, if you listen to him, and if you liked what he said for a while, which they did, John chapter 1, 19 through 27 says that for a while they took pleasure in hearing John the Baptist. 
Jesus, in his kindness, for their salvation's sake, appeals to John, who they listened to. And he said, if you listen to his words, should you not then accept the Messiah that he pointed to? Like, if he was good enough to give ear to, should not he also be sufficient enough to believe when John said, I must decrease and he must increase? So the first testimony, the lesser testimony, is John the Baptist that Jesus appeals to for his Messiahship. But now he appeals to the Father, and he does this in three ways. He appeals to to his own works, the works that God has given him. He appeals to the Father himself, and then he appeals to the Scriptures. So let's look at Jesus' own works. Jesus' own works, verse 36. I have a greater witness than John. For the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. Now, I want you to know something very crucial and very key to the understanding of this text. Many of your translations will have you intersperse the word testimony with witness. Sometimes it's testimonies. I give testimony. I bear witness. I have borne witness. These words, witness and testimony, all are coming from the same Greek root word. There's one idea in this passage that is just being repeated over and over, whether it's the verb form to testify or to witness of, or whether it's the subject form, the noun form, testimony or witness, whatever it is, it's all the same word in Greek. So this Greek word is repetitious over and over and over again in this text which means to shed light on or to give testimony of. That's what Jesus is saying. And he's saying, my works testify of me. They're a greater witness. The works which the Father has given Jesus to finish, this is what he's talking about. And Jesus is in the process of completing these works. They include all of Jesus' ministry, including the signs that we've spent so much time talking about, but they point to a climactic work the work of redemption achieved on the cross. Remember, the Son only does what the Father does. Remember, the Son only works because the Father works, verse 19. So water into wine, showing of the nobleman's son, shows Jesus is the Messiah. The cleansing of the temple shows Jesus is the Messiah. The raising of the lame man shows that Jesus is the Messiah. And more works, greater works, verse 20, will be shown so that you may marvel. Well, what are these greater works that are coming? Well, more sick will be healed, more blind will be given sight, and Lazarus will raise from the dead. And Jesus himself will experience the resurrection of life. So Jesus is linking his works strongly, tightly. He's combining his works with the works of the Father. And he says, look, The works that I do, how amazing they are, how impressive they are, they merely do one thing. They show you and they show the world and they show all of history that I am the Son of God. The works that I do bear testimony of me. But not only the works, but the Father himself. The Father himself bears witness that Jesus is the Messiah This could be a reference to the voice that comes out of heaven at Jesus' baptism. While that specific voice from heaven is not recorded in the Gospel of John, it is recorded in other Gospels. And at Jesus' baptism, the Father says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. But I think it's more than that. It's not merely what the Father would say from heaven, but it is his eternal plan from the beginning of time. The Father himself has demonstrated, he is witnessing, he is testifying from the beginning of time that there was a redemptive plan in place and his son, Jesus Christ, was the Messiah who would bring it to pass. If you can, turn your pages in your Bible to the book of Ephesians. Or if you have your phone, just go to the next book, just type it in Ephesians chapter one. And let me show you how the Father's eternal plan for redemption from the beginning of time bears witness to Jesus as the Messiah. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. I want you to notice all the verbs, all the action 
that God does on behalf of people through the Son to give testimony that Jesus is the Messiah. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has, here's the first one, blessed us with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he, the Father, chose, that's the second one, us in him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. He, God, the Father, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to God himself, according to the good pleasure of God's own will, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he, God, made us, here's the fourth one, accepted in the beloved. Verse 7, I believe in him still means in God. In God we have redemption through Christ's blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his God's grace, which he made abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having God having made known to us the mystery of his will, God's will. What is that will? The redemptive plan for all time. According to his own good pleasure, God's good pleasure, which God purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, God might gather together in one all things in who? Christ. Both which are in heaven and which are on earth in Christ. In God we have attained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of God's glory. Don't you see, from Genesis 3 on, God has been pushing Christ forward as the Messiah. From the time Eve sinned and God promised that the serpent's head would be crushed in her offspring, God has been testifying that Jesus Christ is the Messiah of the world. From the implementation of the sacrificial system and the white spotless lambs being killed and their blood being spilled on the altar for the sins of the Israelites, God has been pushing Jesus Christ forward as the testimony of the redemptive plan of God. From the time he promised Abraham that your children will be like the sands of the sea and the stars of the sky, and in your seed, he says, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. God has been pushing Jesus Christ forward as the focus of the redemptive plan for the whole world. So when Jesus says, God himself has spoken of me, how do you think these Jewish leaders would have felt? Like you're invoking God as one of your four witnesses? How dare you? If we didn't hate you before, we hate you now. But as we know, the entire Old Testament points to one man, Jesus Christ. Amen. What about the scriptures? Verse 39 and 40. Look at what Jesus says. You search the scriptures... For in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me that you may not have life. This is a tricky one for us. Because we think, this is scary. These people have searched the scriptures and Jesus is accusing them now of thinking in error that they have found eternal life in the scriptures. What do we do with this, Curtis? What, what, what is the problem here? Jesus is implying to them, not that they have studied the scriptures in vain, not that they have studied the scriptures uh, with wrong motivation, they have failed to see Jesus in the scriptures. See Jesus in the scriptures will not lead to salvation. Where did it lead these Jewish men? To law, to works. So much so that they added more laws around the laws that God had given them to the fact that they told this man, you're not even allowed to carry a mat on the Sabbath. We're going to break the law. The scriptures, even the Old Testament scriptures, without Christ, 
are futile and in vain to save people. Jesus Christ is the one true Messiah. Listen, John understood that all the scriptures speak to Christ, the writer of the Gospel of John. In John 2, 17, when he drives out the changers, the money temple, he quotes Psalm 69, verse 9, and he says, zeal for your house consumes me. And John understood, well, that meant Jesus. In John chapter 6, which we'll get to next week, when Jesus expounds on the manna that came down from heaven, Jesus applies it to himself, that he is the bread of life. And John understood, oh, the Old Testament manna points to Jesus Christ. In John chapter 6, verse 44 and 45, Jesus says that no one will come to the Father unless the Father draws him. And he refers to Isaiah 54, 13, when he says, it is written in the prophets, they will all be taught, listen, they will all be taught by God. And Jesus applies that verse to himself. When he's teaching them, he says, you'll all be taught by God. In John 7, 38, Jesus compares the Holy Spirit to the living water which will flow out from Jesus himself and will satisfy everyone who drinks of him. And most astonishingly of all, in John chapter 12, John quotes from Isaiah chapter 6. You know that famous passage where Isaiah is in, in the throne room of God and he sees God high and lifted up and the, the train of his robe. There's angels and smoke and he falls down on his face. And John quotes from Isaiah chapter 6 verse 10 which says holy 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 is the lord of hosts the whole earth is full of his glory and john says in john 12 41 isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him implying john says that isaiah saw the glory of god and spoke of christ who was to come see all of the scriptures point us they testify, they witness that Jesus is the Messiah. This impacts the way we look at scriptures. We have a few theologies about the word of God. One, that the word of God is enough. We call that sufficiency. We believe the word of God is clear. We call that perspicuity. We believe the word of God is final. You don't have to pay the food tastes better. Isn't that true? I'd like to thank Steve right here. Steve and Mina took my wife and I out to dinner. We had a tremendous time. Mina is a member of our church. She and Steve are going to be getting married here in about three weeks. And uh, hopefully Steve will be a future member of Grace Baptist Church. No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> They're members of a care group with Joe. Joe White and Cheryl. So I was talking to them last night. Tell me about your care group. They started listening to all the people that are in there. I think Dennis and Mary are in there and many others, okay? I think Neil and Julie are in there. And Lee and I said, oh, what a great care group to be in for a young couple getting married. The variety of circumstances that God has allowed to come into your life and into your life and into your life to model for them. Ooh, hello. To model for them. <laughs> A godly marriage. And wouldn't we say to this beautiful young couple, you should listen to them. 
You should listen to their testimony about how good marriage is and how, how God works through marriage to make us holy and to sanctify us. But wouldn't we also say to them, if you spend an entire year into that care group and you reject all the wisdom from those older couples, if you just come out of that care group thinking, those old people, they don't know anything about marriage, right? Wouldn't we say in the, in the face of multiple testimony, they're foolish? What does that say to us when we don't believe Jesus? When we hear his words, we let him go. We neglect him. We ignore him. We choose to live our life every day as if his words aren't the most powerful thing. They don't come directly from God. They're not breathed down from heaven. They're optional. We can obey today and disobey tomorrow. It's okay. We are foolish. We're the ignorant ones who in the face of all the testimony of Jesus Christ as the Messiah, treat him as if he's not and live our lives with our heads buried in the sand. Is the word of God that testifies about Jesus Christ sufficient for you to parent? Can you trust what the Bible says about how to train your children, how to discipline your children, how to raise them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord? Can you trust what the Bible has to say about sexuality and gender and warn your children? Can you do that? Is the Bible good enough for that? Is the Bible sufficient enough to help you in your marriage? Good marriage, bad marriage, angry marriage, lazy marriage. Can you take your problems to the word of God and apply the biblical principles that point to Jesus Christ and have a God-pleasing marriage? Is it sufficient for that? We sang a song this morning, and though I tread the darksome path, is the Bible sufficient enough to walk you through the dark corridor of death? For some of us, death will come quickly. We won't see it, boom, there's the door. We're crossing Jordan, we're into heaven. But for some of us, we walk that dark corridor of death slowly. We lose our sight, we lose our ears, we lose our mind, we lose our feeling, we lose our abilities, and we feel death creeping in. And listen, it's hard to talk about, it's hard to say, but the truth is we are all walking down that path. And is the word of God sufficient enough to help you with your walker, with your wheelchair towards death? Do you believe that Jesus is the Messiah? It will impact the way you die. What about us for the church? The fact that Jesus is the Messiah, what does it impact for us? Does it impact our worship? I mean, me and Jack Lucky sang the best duet this morning right over here. I love singing with our church for multiple reasons. One, because we sing great songs. Because we sing without fear, without inhibition, without holding back. Why? Because, not because we're great singers. I mean, heaven knows, we, we mess up a lot. But because the God we sing about is great. Does it impact our counseling? Like if we bring people in, are we going to tell them, is there hope in anyone else? Where else are we going to go? The disciples said, you have the words of eternal life. We, we tell them about Jesus. We do biblical counseling, not, not, not worldly counseling, not psychological counseling, not... Uh, any other type of counseling, we want them to see Jesus. Why? Because he's the hope of the world. It's been testified. It's in the scriptures. Amen. How does it impact our evangelism as a church? You know, Pilgrim's Progress, the main character at the beginning, finds a book that warns him of his impending death and judgment. And he's reduced to tears and panic at the beginning of the book, Pilgrim's Progress. Nobody understands his concerns his fear of dying and the weight that he's carrying around, they're all scoffing at him until a character finds him. You know what that character's name is? Evangelist. Evangelist. And evangelist comes and he says things to this main character whose name is Christian. He says, flee from the wrath to come. He tells him, the just shall live by faith. He tells him, enter in at the straight gate. The life of our church, if we're based on a Bible, a sufficient Bible that points to Jesus as the Messiah, we have to be evangelistic. The church won't grow if we don't tell people about Jesus. I mean, like we can rob people from other churches. We, we can do things better than other churches do and get those people in there. But God's big kingdom, his big church, won't move forward unless somebody like us tells them Jesus is the way the truth, and the life. And some of us have, haven't shared the gospel of Jesus for years. We haven't told anybody. 
We, we've, we've swallowed the gospel and refuse to give it back. These are the four testifiers of Jesus, these who testify. John the Baptist, Jesus' own works, the Father himself, and the Scriptures. But can I briefly take you to what Jesus does next? He indicts these Jewish leaders for their unbelief. There's five indictments, five of them. We'll go through them quickly. Look at verse 37. Now, I, want, I hope you see that when we preach, when Pastor Kevin and I preach and the other elders preach, like we, just, we just point out, like we're not making anything up. It's right here in the verse, okay? So in verse 37, there's three indictments. I'll just show them to you. You can see what they are. The very first one. Jesus says to these people, you have never heard the voice of God. He indicts them for their unbelief. Why don't you believe me? You've never heard his voice. Unlike Moses in the Old Testament, whom you claim to love and follow and you're a disciple of Moses, unlike Moses who actually heard the voice of God, you've never heard the voice of God. That word heard there can also be translated heeded, as if not merely hearing the sound, but also doing what the sound says. Like your fathers, like your Israelite fathers in the Old Testament who did not obey the word of God, they received the commands, they received the covenant from God, but they worshiped idols, they turned, they intermarried, they did all sorts of sinful things, and it led to their downfall, to their enslavement, to their captivity. He says, you like them do not listen to the word of God. You have not seen God. You don't even know what he's like. You're blind. You're like a sinner, blind. You don't even know what you're reaching for. You're just groveling around in the darkness. At least Moses got to go up to the mountain, and he got to see the hinder part of God in his glory. But he had to come down and give you the commandments, and you haven't even seen God. You're so blind. And then he says, his word doesn't abide in you. This is a reference to, back to Joshua chapter 1 verse 8 and 9, where Joshua like, said, me and my house, we're going to follow the word of the Lord. Like Our lives are built on his word. We hide his word in our hearts. Psalm 119, verse 11. These people do not have the word of God living in them. And these men had memorized large portions of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. They would have committed them to memory. They could have quoted them for you. And Jesus here is indicting them, saying, you don't even know the Bible. It has no place in your life. What about for us? We marry unbelievers. We make financial decisions without even consulting with our Lord. We go into debt without considering the impact on our giving. We raise our children without asking the Heavenly Father to give us grace and mercy to guide our children. We do all sorts of things without acknowledging the Word of God. Many of us can live multiple days without even having the word of God impacting our lives. Some of us live in open and willful sin, and some of us are living in secret sin. John would look at us and say, the word of God is not even abiding in you. It's not even making a difference in the way you live. You've set your course, and you are unswayed or unhindered by the power of God's word pushing against you. Notice what Jesus says at the end of verse 37. He says... The father, um, you have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form, but you do not have his word abiding in you, verse 38, because whom he sent, him you do not believe. The implication is this. If you believed that Jesus was the Son of God, then you would have heard the voice of God. Because when Jesus speaks, he speaks the words of God. If you would have believed Jesus was the Messiah, then you would have seen God, because Jesus is the express image of God. If you would have if you would take what God says and, and abide by it and obey it, then that means the word of God is abiding in you because Jesus, at the beginning of John chapter 1, is the word. Two more indictments. Look at verse 42. These are the indictments of unbelief. You don't even listen to God. You've never seen God. You don't even obey his word. Verse 42, his love is not even in you. His love is not even in you. I know you, that you do not have the love of God in you. This is not God's love for them. This is their love for God. They don't love God. And it's revealed in their rejection of the Son. In the same chapter, John chapter 5, verse 20, it says the Father loves the Son. The Father loves the Son. And in John 3, 16, it says that God loves the world and gave his Son. So when you reject Jesus Christ, you're demonstrating that you don't love God. You can say you love God, but if you reject his Son, then you don't love 
God. If you loved Jesus, you would love God. And the last indictment is you don't even seek his glory, verse 44. You don't even seek his glory. How can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor, or some of your translations there will say glory, the glory that comes from the only God. These men, these Jewish leaders, were trading in their own glory. They were all about them. What they can do to look better, and to be, to be more exposed, and to be more admired, and to be more out in the open and followed. And Jesus stands in stark contrast to them. Because he only values the glory that comes from God. He says, I don't even need the approval of man. I don't even need the testimony of man to carry out my divine mission. I'm going to do it for one person and one person only for the glory of God. And you do not live that way. We go about our careers, our reputation. We find people groups that we aspire to be, to be the top of or to be the best of or to be the alpha in, right? We want to be well thought of. We live for our glory. I'll trade you some glory if you give me some glory back. You scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. Let's ascend. Let's, let's push ourselves. Let's be noticed. Let's be successful. Let's prosper. It doesn't matter if you belong to a small group, if you're just ascending to the top of the PTA or the top of your neighborhood watch It doesn't matter. Or if you're trying to ascend to the top of Congress or the world. It doesn't matter. The question is, who are you living for? Are you living for what God thinks about you? The glory that comes from God? Do you want God to look down and say, this one is doing what I've told him to do? Or are you living for the glory of other people? What about in care group? This might lead to a lack of transparency. Lying to other brothers and sisters in church. Because you don't want them to think bad of you. So you're going to sugarcoat it. No, our marriage is great great. No, I didn't sleep on the couch last night. Oh, no, please, please. It's comfortable. But you know, wait, 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 we pretend. What, 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 because why? We, we care about what you think. So instead of being honest and confessing our sin and saying, look, I'm weak in this area. I should be strong. Shame on me. I should be mature after being saved for 30 years, but I'm immature. We value being thought of as mature more than we value being mature we hide our sin we manipulate the truth why because we don't seek the glory that comes from god we seek our own glory this is an indictment on unbelief so the question is do you listen to his voice do you fill your mind with images of christ what kind of what kind of things are you looking at what do you see what dictates your eye gate and your ear gate is it sinfulness wickedness is it cursing is it sexuality is it pride is it backstabbing is it scheming What do you live for? Does the love of God abide in you? Do you seek his glory? Here's the final conclusion of this, point number three. The sad exposure of selfish desires. Why Why would people live this way? Why would they have Jesus and disregard him? Why would they live in unbelief and not see him, hear him, believe him, love him, and seek his glory? Why why would they not do that? Here's the sad exposure of selfish desire. Would you look with me at verse 40? Just this one small phrase explains, I think, Jesus' understanding of these people. He says in verse 40, You are not willing to come to me that you may have life. I took three years of Greek, and it's almost all lost to me now. So I'm going to try and pronounce this word, and it's going to be wrong, but only five of you are going to know that I pronounce it wrong, okay? It doesn't matter. But this word willing comes from the word fellow. It means to desire or want. This is what Jesus is saying to these people. You don't come to me because you don't want to. It's not a matter of ignorance. It's not a matter of knowledge. It's not a matter of being in the right place at the right time. It's not a matter of ability. You don't believe. You haven't seen me. You haven't heard me. You don't abide in my word. You don't seek my glory. You don't seek my love because you don't want to. Full on rejection. Unbelievers are unable to want Christ. Christians sometimes are unwilling to want Christ. Christians have formed habits of thinking 
patterns of behavior, systems of life, forms of communication over time in our marriages and our behavior that make it difficult to obey. I've looked at this so long, I can't stop looking at it. I've shot this so long, I can't stop shooting it. I've drank this so long, I can't stop drinking it. This is just how me and my wife talk. I've yelled at her so long, this is just how we talk. Right? She's, she's talked behind my back for so long, this is just how we talk. We, we, we create these patterns and habits and systems that make obedience difficult, but the truth is, we sin because we want to. We're not helpless. We're not hands tied behind our back. Well, the only option for me today is to step into this grievous sin. At every point, at every point of decision, we can choose to please God. And when we sin, here's what we're saying. Jesus Christ, you're the Messiah of the world. I don't want to be under you today. I want to be the king. I want to be the ruler. I want to live for myself. Unbeliever, you're unable to love God. You're unable to desire God until God reaches down into your heart and you want to cry out for forgiveness and mercy and say, God, help me to love you. Help me to know you. That's the same prayer for Christians today. Lord, help me not to love my sin. Help me to love you more than I love my sin. I want to want you, God, not the sin that I've been trapped in for so long. Let me close this point with this illustration Jonathan Lehman writes about this in his book, Reverberation. This is a friend of his, a man named Richard from Nigeria. He was a Muslim, and he lived in Nigeria in one of the the thickest, staunchest Muslim kind of village enclaves. Everyone there was Muslim. There's hardly any Christians at all. This was in 1978, and by chance, this man, Richard, was given a Bible by a Christian friend. But he knew he wasn't supposed to read this Bible as it was against his his Muslim practice, so what he would do is he would use the pages of this Bible to roll himself cigarettes. And late one night, he tore out a page, rolled a cigarette, and stuffed the Bible back in his pocket, you know, to keep rolling more cigarettes later. But as he could not sleep that night, in his boredom, he opened the Bible to the next page that he hadn't torn out yet, and it was Psalm 34, verse 8. This is the testimony of this man. He said, I read this verse, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy is the man who puts his trust in him. That Nigerian Muslim man was saved that night because he saw that the world he loved was empty and decrepit, unable to provide pleasure and salvation. And he saw that Jesus Christ was good. And he prayed, Lord, this was his prayer, I want to taste and see that you're good. And he became a Christian. That's not a bad prayer to pray. Lord, I want to taste and see that you're good. my, My life is empty. I'm midlife crisis. I don't know, purposeless, meaningless life, going through the motions, dragging my feet, marriage, no passion, kids don't respect me. I'm just fluffing along in life. What are you going to pray? What's going to change? You're going to say, Lord, help me to love you. Help me to see that you're good and you're worthwhile. Not change careers, not, not find a new wife, not, not hang out less with my kids, not change my personality or take a personality test or do this or do that. No, there's only one solution to the malaise of life. I want to love you. Help me to love you. You're good. You're good. You're the one who can save us from ourselves. Can't you see? They embraced John until he pointed them to Jesus. They marveled at his miracles, but they rejected his claims that he was the Messiah. They loved the Father until Jesus said, I and my Father are one. They thought they knew the scriptures, but they really didn't because they couldn't see Jesus. The whole time, they weren't rejecting John or his miracles or the Father or the Scriptures. They were always rejecting Jesus. He's the litmus test of our faith. He's the litmus test of our worship, our evangelism, our obedience, our humility, you name it. Jesus is the guide and the litmus test. The question today is, will you believe, will you embrace Jesus? Christians, for you, instead of a prayer of salvation, what that looks like is a prayer of repentance. I'm sorry, Lord, for living as if you're not the Messiah, for living as if you're not the King, and I want to love you and live for your glory. Let's pray together.
Father, we thank you for these who testify of Jesus, John the Baptist, the works, the scriptures, and the Father himself. And Lord, we stand guilty. There are times where we do not, we do not see you. We do not obey your word. We do not love you. We do not live for your glory. Not because, Lord, as Christians, we are unable to, but because we are unwilling to, we forget that you're good. Lord, change our appetites, change our desires, change our taste buds. Help us, Lord, to long to love you. majority of their life, but today they've seen, maybe for the first time, that they have not embraced Jesus as the Messiah. They stumbled at that final stone, and they know, they, they know in their hearts that they are not a Christian because they have rejected Jesus. They've embraced tradition, they've embraced culture, they've embraced Baptist, they've embraced church, but they've rejected Jesus. Lord, may today they humble themselves and come to you and find salvation in Jesus Christ. We pray that in his name, amen.